20 now with 30 all across Guyana and you're listening to Kaiju Radio. It is time to enter room 592 this evening at the helm of the program, Dr. Yog Mahadio, alongside senior journalist of Kaiju News, Lenny Gildari. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, good evening, one and all viewers and listeners all across Guyana and wherever you're joining us from. Welcome to room 592, where we unleash the truth. And ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are being joined by two guests. I know Miss Manichan has been here. I think Kevin did something and, and hit everyone out of the room for a minute just now. But we are getting back together. And Kevin, please let Miss Miss Manichan get in. Um, I think Mr. Gildari is there as well. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Room 592, where we unleash the truth as we welcome you from all across the world, all across Guyana, wherever you're joining us from tonight. Is a hot, hot night for us here in this room. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we want to deconstruct this entire thing called rigging. What's rigging? What's being rigged? Who is rigging? And all of that we'll be discussing tonight. Just as we get going with this show, I want to remind everyone of the status quo of things happening in Guyana. I want to remind everyone, as of today, the tabulation is over, over and done with. Tabulation is out of the way. Also, let us take note. And I see Mr. Hamilton here with us. I know Ms. Manichand is joining us. So here is what's happened. Take note. The last time around, Mr. Hamilton and Leonard, I think you were there, but I'm not seeing you. The last time around, Mr. Lowenfield expeditiously presented a report accommodating a fraudulent declaration. Yet he prepared that report knowing it was uh, containing fraudulent information. That report was taken and presented to the commission. The commission, fortunately, to the credit of Madam Claudette Singh, did not entertain a discussion on that report, and so it was held in abeyance. As well, what had happened at that stage on March 13th and thereafter is that when Mr. Lowenfield presented that tainted report, knowingly, I wish to remind the viewers and listeners, Mr. Lowenfield knowingly presented false information to the commission. So my point is the alacrity with which he prepared his report then, I hope Mr. Lowenfield exhibits that same alacrity in presenting a, an urgent report to the commission. Ladies and gentlemen, as you're joining us on this show tonight, we want to have some discussions um, on the elections and deconstructing this whole aspect of rigging, who is rigging, what is being rigging, and where this whole thing of rigging start from. And I want to shock Mr. Hamilton and Ms. Manichan by telling you two, good sir and good lady, that as of this morning, I heard from a newscast, well, a feed coming out, that apparently the PPP start rigging since 1964. I did not know the PPP was in government since 1964. We're going to deal with all of that. But ladies and gentlemen, just before we get to the elections, just before we look at this rigging, you have all asked us if we can secure some different opinion as to what our students are facing in this country as we speak presently. We know students are getting ready to write exams. We know the decision of the exams have been made. But the problem is the impasse that this nation now sees between the teachers being told not to turn out to work and the children being told you have to be ready for exams. So we thought that we would invite to this program no other than the former Minister of Education to share with us her thoughts on this impasse we are, we are in presently, because in my opinion, my personal opinion, and I'm sure Kaicho Radio shares this opinion, our children are of utmost importance. And any decision we make as a people must make 
those must take those children for the importance that they deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, one day we are gone, but it's the children that we work for and they will inherit everything. Ms. Manichan, welcome this, to this program, ma'am. As a former Minister of Education, and I'm not sure what would be your new portfolio in a new government, but we're going to deal with that later. What's your thoughts on this current impasse, and what would you advise uh, our students and teachers, and what, what are you saying to Guyana? I don't think Ms. Mannington can hear us. Can you hear us, Ms. Mannington? Okay. Kevin, can you please see if we can get Ms. Mannington on with that? Um, she probably cannot hear us. We can hear you. Did you hear me? Meanwhile, we're... Right, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Meanwhile, we're getting there, ladies and gentlemen. I want to also discuss what's what's going on presently and put the facts to you. Timetables for CSEC, timetables for uh, the advanced uh, examination, they have all been set. Leonard and I, on our shows, we have been discussing the fact that while these timetables are set, the children are facing this thing of having exams in front of them. But we also need to know and we also need to appreciate that not all of our children can wear masks. The children who are asthmatic, children who are sick, children who have different conditions, they, not all of them are comfortable. Neither would it be healthy for them all to wear masks, to go to school, and to be in certain conditions. There has been no declaration or no Leonard declaration is a bad word to use, but no advisory coming out to the public as to what could be uh, done for our special needs children and for children as a whole. And while we're getting to that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to quickly segue off to Leonard. What is happening at your end, my friend? Well, in the meantime, while you continue to blame um, Kevin here, let me tell you, this morning, the last couple of days, we would have been receiving many complaints. Let me take uh, this opportunity to say good afternoon to all of our uh, viewers and listeners across this nation and wherever you are out of Guyana. And, of course, a uh, special welcome to our two guests, Peter Manik Chan and Mr. Hamilton. Um, and let me tell you, with regards to uh, the... Um, the COVID-19 and the students and the decision to write the exams. Well, we would see very clearly here that the GTU, the Guyana Teachers Union, has one opinion, um, don't go back to school, continue teaching via the internet or whatever you're doing. Um, on the other hand, some teachers have gone back um, or they are making preparations, classrooms clean and so on. Uh, many parents have been calling us and saying that, uh, you know, the students, the children, they have uh, special conditions and uh, a lot of them are asthmatic and so on. And so they would not be sending them. My child, uh, my daughter, who's supposed to be writing the grade six exams, she's not going back to school, but will be writing the exams. Uh, uh, that is because we took a conscious decision on that and there'd be many parents like that. But this is um, this entire decision here by the ministry. It is being seen as um, uh, right now by many parents who has been calling us, texting us, and so as something that is not a good thing at the moment. Um, and that is uh, uh, much of an understatement when I say not a good thing. But uh, I think uh, it is going to be, uh, from what we've seen here, um, it is going to be uh, something that's very bad for the children. So, Leonard, I mean, yes, we know that. And you know what? In case we're getting problems having Ms. Manikshan on, we can always bring her on for tomorrow. But I want to get on with the discussion tonight, if you don't mind. And let me welcome Mr. Joe Hamilton here. Mr. Joe Hamilton has been a former MP. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to this. And I want to share some raw facts with all of you. The recount is officially over. Today... At 3 p.m. thereabouts, the final certificate of tabulation was signed and would have been in the possession of the chief elections officer. Now, the recount is officially over. The numbers of these recounts and from these recounts 
are obvious to the world. The world knows these numbers. Ladies and gentlemen, the world knows these numbers. The world knows who would have won these elections and who lost. But guess what? We have re-entered the age of squatting. We have re-entered a realm of squatting. Only now is deemed squatting in public office, unwelcome presence. The electors, the voters of this country spoke since 2nd of March 2020. They spoke loudly and clearly, replacing one government with another. The one that is replaced has been crying like a baby since March 3rd, March 4th. All we have heard is all kinds of cries, accepting, accepting, accepting that you performed miserably and you were given the boots. So ladies and gentlemen, those are the facts as we have them. Here is where it gets even weirder and weirder if one can use that, those phrases. Miss Lawrence, who is an executive of APNU AFC, Miss Lawrence signed a declaration that created 15,000 dead and migrant people. They signed a document that had 15,000 non-existent persons, no name, no serial number. You don't know whether they're alive or dead, whether they migrated or not. They signed that declaration. Later on, they signed another declaration that was even worse. Ms. Joseph and Mr. Mingo signed that declaration. 22,805 persons they created. Let's talk about bloated list if you want. They created people who are not even on the list. This is the ridiculous situation we have. So as I said, the voters voted and now you have squatters in office. I am calling it exactly how I see it. Let's look at their lies. They refused to release their SOPs. They said that all the SOPs in public place, all the Kaicho news printed and Starbrook news printed and everybody printed and shared, they said it was all fake. A recount took place that proved that those, recount, those SOPs were accurate. They're still hiding behind the skirt of those SOPs. Now, where are we today? The recount is over. Mr. Granger knows the numbers. He wants to stay in office. He is crying and begging for a Hail Mary, waiting for GCOM to deliver an election that was not the will of the electorate. And so what they have started to do, they have started to cry. Now the narrative is not your SOPs are false. Now your narrative is not about anything else. Now the narrative is that all of their agents were bribed. All of their agents were bribed. And finally, that somehow or the other, the PPP in conjunction with all the new parties right, uh, fraud, uh, declared or entered into the ballot box fraudulent votes. They had people voting. This is what they're saying, that they had people voting once and twice and thrice. And hear me out, hear me out with this. They're saying there was such impersonification of voters that their own agents fell asleep at the wheel and didn't see when these zombies walked in and cast a ballot. They're also saying that their supervisors who went from polling station to polling station to polling station did not see anybody voted twice, yet they're saying that this election was fraudulent. So ladies and gentlemen, this election, they're saying that is rigged. I want them to remember. Mr. Granger said, what is rigging? He don't want to hear that word rigging. 
And as of today, they have started to say the PPP has been rigging elections since 1964. So now we are rewriting history. We are going to tell a lie so often that we're going to believe it ourselves. But we are not accepting we are squatting in office. This is what they are. So ladies and gentlemen, I have sought the good advice, the good counsel of some friends of mine who said the best person to bring on this discussion is Mr. Joseph Hamilton. Now, Mr. Hamilton, I'll tell all of you this. The first time I ever spoke to Mr. Hamilton in all my life was today when I invited him to come on this show. I never knew I knew of, but never knew the gentleman before. And I'll tell you something, the first time when I spoke to him, the words were not too kind, but the words were very plain. He's a plain speaker. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Joe Hamilton, I want to present him to you all. Here is a gentleman who was the, one of the executive members of the PNC. This gentleman has been an executive of the PNC. He has been in the belly of the beast, so to speak. If one man can talk about rigging, it is this gentleman here. And there are many, many things he can talk to us about. I have asked Mr. Hamilton, and Mr. Hamilton, thank you for being here, sir, because we want to deconstruct this rigging. Are these elections rigged? Where did this notion of rigging start from? All of those things we want to discuss tonight. Mr. Hamilton, have you and your cohorts of the PPP rigged these elections, sir? Uh, yo, good night. Uh, good night, um, Dari and Priya that is going and coming. Uh, good night. Let me start off by saying uh, for the viewers, when I speak about elections and the Guyana Elections Commission, I speak as a technician and as a politician. Because in my former life before politics, I functioned as supervisor for the IT department to the Guyana Elections Commissions preparing for the 92 elections. And I functioned as the manager of the IT department preparing for the local government election in 1994. Uh, the system that they presently utilize, I helped to build that with the UN program between 91 and 92. So I'm laying that before. When I speak about Guyana elections, commission and elections, I'm speaking from a position of knowledge and experience. I'm not just gaffing. A lot of people gaff. Even senior politicians, they talk about things that they don't know about at all. One of the most robust electoral system that exists is uh, in Guyana. And I remember um, in my former life as a PNC executive, arguing for several things that now we have uh, at the Guyana Elections Commission, the whole issue of fingerprinting to deal with um, uh, multiple registration, the whole issue about a polio with photograph, all of those issues uh, create conditions whereby um, this falsity um, cannot happen at a polling place. And that is the reason why, uh, as you said earlier, yo, that is the reason why they shift this conversation to make the point that their agents, 200, 2,000 odd were compromised. They were bought out because APNU AFCP and C recognizes that there is no way you can uh, impersonate people at the election um, booths. So they now say, listen, it happened, but it happened because all our agents, or uh, as someone said, I think James Bond said, 80% of their agents committed um, criminal conduct by uh, conspire with the PPP civic to uh, throw their government out. Second point is 
The PVP has nothing to do with elections other than being a contestant. The PVP is a contestant, just like APNU and all the other new parties. The people who are responsible for managing elections, it is the Ghana Elections Commission with the chairman, commissioners, and a secretariat to do the oper operational work. So how does the PVP uh, rigor an election that they have no control over? Is because, uh, and you mentioned in passing uh, some feed, but I know you were talking about Joe Harmon. And uh, the point is, I normally say that the leadership of the PNC, APNU, AFC, suffer from what you call severe psychosis. And you know, psychosis is characterized by an impaired relationship with reality. That, that is what they have. Uh, Granger and his cabal, they have an impaired relationship with reality because all of us who are sane people, we know what the numbers are. We know how the elections, they went on March 2nd. We know what the count was and we know what the recount is that has finally brought all of this to an end. Third point I want to make, because there is a lot of conversation about what Claudette Singh will do and what she cannot do and what she shouldn't do. An election start with the preparation of a voter's list, because if you don't have a voter's list, you can have no list. And an election conclude with a declaration of the results from the election. So the elections, that is the conclusion of an election, a declaration of how many votes the contestants in the election, contestants, uh, how many votes they garnered from the people. And therefore, I, I, I am trying all the time to stretch my mind and my imagination whereby the Elections Commission and the chairperson can neglect to do a declaration of these records. I, I, right. I, I, it's an impossible thing to even think about. Got you. But he, here is... Here is, here is, Yog, that GCOM can annul the elections again. Impossible. Mm -hmm. Joe, we'll get to that in a moment. I want to I wanna come to deconstruct this whole argument about rigging. And I noticed Ms. Manichan has joined us. So, Ms. Manichan, we have moved on to the elections, but please bear with us. Uh, if, if I may, Priya, um, have you, um, yeah, you have to unmute, unmute your mic. Have you and Joe, Joe, have you guys, answer my question, it's yes or no. Have you guys paid anybody to vote twice? Most of our people, <laughs> most of our people, firstly, uh, let me go with the, with the activists and so are volunteers. And secondly, why would we want to vote? Uh, why would we want to pay people to vote twice? The fact is, Granger has done enough to lose an election. Their own pollster today said that. We can't have been doing polls for, for but, but, Joe, but 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 Joe, I, I coming back to you on that because I want to talk about this thing. I, I we'll talk about the polls. Uh, Miss Manichan, Priya, yes. were you in any way? Have you seen anything in your party that would make you be suspicious of any activities therein? So good night to everybody, Joe Yoga. Hi, Happy to be Priya. here. Um, the, look, I have no doubt in my mind that many persons might have thought we'd love to vote twice. We'd love to vote 10 times because there was a lot of suffering in the last five years that caused people to feel desperate. The thing about it, though, Yoga, is that the, we, the system doesn't allow one to vote twice. It simply right. does not. It does not allow dead people to vote. It does not allow people who are not registered and qualified and eligible to vote. And why do I say that? In, in this election booth, in every polling place, you have at least three GCOM staff trained by GCOM, hired by GCOM. Now, GCOM has been overrun by some 
um, senior people. Let, let's go back a little bit and remember when uh, David Granger appointed unilaterally um, Dave, uh, Mr. Patterson, the old judge, to be uh, mm -hmm. the chairman of GCOM. He then appointed someone called Roxanne Myers. I don't know if you remember that. Mm -hmm. Over and above, a man called Vishnu Prasad. Now, Roxanne was neither qualified nor as qualified nor as experienced as, as the other applicant, Vishnu Prasad. So what you have is, in fact, it was later investigated by the ERC, the Ethnic Relations Commission, and they said there was absolutely no reason why she got the job over and above him. Um, so you have someone that was handpicked by Granger, and he hand that is Patterson, and he handpicked Roxanne Myers, no rhyme or reason. She didn't qualify more than the other applicants. And she is the person who hired GCOM staff. And GCOM staff went to these polling places. Each polling place had at least three persons. Then you had a policeman at every polling place. You had a PPP agent, you had a PNC agent, a PNU agent, whatever you want to call them. You had small parties. We had international observers. We had local observers. In many instances, most of these people um, came together as strangers for the first time at 4.30 that morning. So they didn't come together there as friends. They came together as adversaries. You remember this was mm -hmm. like heat, heated, hotly contested election. People calling people names, people saying nasty things about each, each other's parties. So the two agents did not come together there as friends. They came together there to watch each other, to make sure they're not doing something wrong. And you mm -hmm. had that across the country in 2,339 polling places. So even if somebody wanted to go and vote twice to get rid of Mr. Granger or to block your finale from going in, because you have both mm -hmm. sides that might, might be tempted to do something wrong. There were so many stop gaps. Um, so, so these are the 12 people that came together in each polling place that were looking at each other suspiciously. Then you have each polling place, every agent had this thing called a folio, which is really a sheet of paper that has a very clearly um, depicted photograph of each voter. So when Priya Manikchan walks in, if I say I'm going to vote for Betty up the road, you see my face. Betty and I are unlikely to be looking alike, and everybody's looking at each other's face. I didn't vote Correct. with an ID card. Correct. I didn't use an ID card. So I saw everybody looking at me, looking at the photographs, mm -hmm. confirming that it was me. If you use an ID card, they look at your ID card's picture and the mm -hmm. person who's holding the, the um, ID card. So then you have that process where, where right. people are identified through that. And then when you're finished voting, you have to stick your finger in ink and that ink doesn't come off. We all experienced right. it. It doesn't come off for a few weeks. People still have ink now, three weeks later, um, three months later. So but, but I'll, tell you, I'll, 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 I'll tell you something. We have had this discussion, but sorry to interject, but here is how I want to uh, remind everybody. Look, these elections in Guyana, we have, Leonard, you remember we had an overseas person on this show who said Guyana's safeguards in these elections are way above many other countries. Ladies and gentlemen, it is because of these safeguards that Mingo was caught. Yeah. It is because of these safeguards that every process had to stop so that now, they're now just praying for a Hail Mary. And what I want to remind everybody, God listens to everybody. So don't feel only one side is praying, everybody is praying. And everybody is also praying that Madam Claude Singh makes the decision and makes it early. But Priya, sorry to interject there, because the truth is that this, Bruce Golding said it so right. There has been, never been, such a transparent attempt at rigging. And Joe, I want to throw this back to you. How does this rigging compare to the rigging of the 1970s, my friend? No, the, the thing is, the thing is, listen. <laughs> Different um, world, cameras all over. <laughs> no, world. No, I, and, and that is what, just, just the point is, is that PNC was attempting to rig an elections in 2020. So they were attempting to do a 1970s, 1980s matter with the TV on and the cameras rolling. And that, that, is a, that is a issue here. 
uh, they apparently still think we were we were back there in time. But before 1992, you collected all the boxes and you took them to one uh, mm -hmm. place in a location and uh, you counted. And that was nominated by um, the People's National Congress, the, 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 the elections commissions itself. Right. Uh, people should be reminded. The elections commission was not an autonomous uh, organization. The elections commission before 92 was a department of the Ministry of Home Affairs. Mm -hmm. Registration was done by the Ministry of Home Affairs. Uh, the election right up to 1992, when I functioned at the elections commission, the elections commission was still under the Ministry of Home Affairs. It is after the 1992 election, then the Elections Commission became an autonomous uh, organization. Before then, when the elections is finished, I think it was three months after, the, the, the Elections Commission had to shut up shop because it was just for the election. Now it became permanent and therefore, what change is that you count the ballots at the place of poll? Mm -hmm. Firstly. Secondly, uh, the military is not involved like, like they used to be when Mr. Granger was the commander at Iron Ghana in mm -hmm. shuttling ballot boxes via the army planes and trucks. Uh, so a lot of things have changed um, since then. But but, but I, I'll tell you what, when I saw, when I saw the first, the, the first, the March 3rd, March 4th attempt, and then later it came to the March 13th attempt, I made a post on social media that it seems like Harold Bollers and his crew have resurrected. I didn't know, Priya, that, um, you know, they will, they will now deem that a lot of dead persons voted. Viewers and listeners, it is important we have this discussion because I want everybody to remember. I am a voter. Ms. Manichand, Mr. Hamilton, Mr. Gildari, they're all voters. You have all been voters. And when you walk into that room, as Priya was saying, your photo is there. Somebody watch you, look at their photo. Somebody sh ask you, show me your fingers to ensure you haven't voted twice. All of those checks and balances are in place. Yet we have the situation where they're saying these elections were so fraudulent and now somebody's, uh, many people are on their knees begging that, that um, uh, Justice Claudette Singh is going to say, uh, or is going to deliver their Hail, Hail Mary. Joe, would, would Mr. Burnham have, have uh, been proud of, of these, these, these attempts? <laughs> I, I, Mr. Burnham was a suave and sophisticated um, leader with all his faults. What you have here, as described by the uh, by the political leaders in the Caribbean, is a sanctimonious gangster. So, so mm -hmm. that, that is a far way removed from um, from where the PNC used to be. So, you have yes. a, a, a man here who uh, was good, I could say. Granger did well in 2011 and 2015, deceiving Guyanese people. Uh, that he was some moral and upright and righteous man. But um, the deeds came forward um, mm -hmm. 2015, uh, right up to this moment. And yes. so, you know, uh, yo, Glenard, I tell you this. You know, I was uh, begged in 2011 uh, to support David Granger, and I refused to do that and supported Donna Ramatar and the PVP ticket because. My assessment then was of Granger was that he had autocratic tendencies. And history has proved me to be right. Uh, and I, when I campaigned with the PVP 2011, 2015, when people were talking about change, most of young people, I, I, I was saying to them, I am trying to understand new people. Mm -hmm. A man is coming out of the belly of the beast and he's telling you this is the animal and you saying that this animal can change. And, and so you, you understand, and I yes. said, you don't know what you were asking for when you were talking about, you know, you, 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 you wanted change. Uh, right. 
So, so, so but, but, so, but, but, so, one has to admit. I mean, I know you have come, and, and to viewers and listeners, Mr. Joe Hamilton was previously an executive of the PNC that has later years joined the PPP and has been a parliamentarian for the PPP. Ms. Manichan I'm, 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 I'm too has joined the PPP up to this moment. Oh, well, I'm he's civic part of the of civic. Thank you, thank you for that correction. Support. Thank you for that correction. And Ms. Manichan to herself has joined and would have come in as a, a, a person with technocrat skills, experience, to join and support the PPP government, not necessarily as a member of the PPP. Before I come back to you both, I want to just say something, because somebody just texted me and asked me, Leonard, if this show is a PNC bashing show. Ladies and gentlemen, take it how you want. This show, the byline is unleash the truth. And Joe, to your point, one has to admit that in 2015, the voters voted. And unfortunately or fortunately, they voted you guys out of office. You have been in opposition, you accepted your loss, and you have learned, hopefully, you guys have learned a serious lesson. Priya, I want to throw this at you, because here is what. You would have faced uh, a lot of criticisms yourself um, for, for, for your work, for me, whatever it is. Having sat in opposition, what would have been your thoughts knowing that people voted you out, but seeing that the self-same reason you were voted out are now perpetrated in an even worse manner by a new government? What would have been your thoughts, Matt? So let me just say very clearly, whether people were right or wrong, and obviously I don't hold their view because we contested the election um, very furiously uh, in 2015. So I held the view that the People's Progressive Party was the better option. But in 2015, the people of Ghana didn't hold that view, and that had to have been respected, and that was respected. Four or five days after the election, we were out of office. We had come out, we had gone into... Um, well, we, we took a couple of weeks before we went into Parliament, but the will of the people of this country, whether you think they're right or they're wrong, you have to respect it. That is what elections are about. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the period, the, the particular question you're asking is, is such a deep question. How did I feel? I, I never, ever resented people for throwing us out. Never resented people for feeling that they needed a change. For me, I think getting a full picture of what service looks like, looks like um, had to, and you wouldn't have known it except you sat in opposition benches, had to have, we had to have experienced that period in opposition. Um, so uh, you have a fuller picture of what it looks like. But what we also know, and this is what I think is useful and telling and is very informative for the nation, is that Prior to 2015, you had a very, very, it was an imbalanced race. You had the PVP who had been in office for 23 years. Um, and, you know, incumbency comes with a lot of burdens by itself at election time. And you had a party, well, a coalition who had gotten together and they had become so attractive, very, very attractive, very sexy to the population, especially the young people. Because for them, they had an answer for everything. They had a plaster for every sort. But if you listen carefully, even during their campaigning in 2015, you would have seen that what they were good at was saying what was wrong. They were never putting forward solutions that could get lost in the noise of campaigning. Mm -hmm. So I think the best thing that could have happened for us as a country is that we have experienced um, all the parties right now that that have uh, sway amongst the population and people get to make an informed choice. And so this election 2020 for me is an election where people got to measure and weigh what would make their individual lives better, what would be good for the future of Ghana. And they spoke. And in the same way that we, we respected those voices in 2015, we must respect them now. This is not even about the PPP and the PNC. You know, this is about disrespecting Correct. all these people in Guyana who got Correct. up, went to the polls, did what GCOM asked them to do. Go there, find out where they were supposed to vote before the election, turn up on election day between 6 and 6. 
um, present themselves, present their ID card, vote, mm -hmm. ink their fingers, go home and wait. They did all that they were asked to do. And so while we get lost in the big parties, well, the PPP win or the PPP, uh, the PNC lost or the APNU is, is crookish or whatever, this is really about the people of Guyana. And their voices and will must be heard. And for me, it's, it's, um, it is very disrespectful to, to the very voters, including their own voters and supporters that, that came out and voted. And they're going to, this is going to be a harsh price yes. that the PNC, AP, and UAFC pay. They have right. lost support from election day to now. You have people openly saying, listen, I voted for you, but I can't do this. I can't but allow yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. We, ha we have another big problem, don't we? I mean, look, we'll talk a little bit, or maybe on another day, I want to bring some of you guys back because we need to talk about the state of the economy. We need to talk about the balance sheet that you guys are going to be taking over. But I want to come to something else. Look, the truth is that we being where you are, here is the worst thing that has happened. A good government needs a good opposition. You know, the National Assembly needs to be representing the will of the people to have good people there. Now, if when the PPP gets into office, what I am seeing here as an independent person, and I'm sure Leonard agrees with me, is that we are seeing an opposition that has been decimated by their own lies, by their own deceit. How can people even expect them to be a good opposition? Now, you guys have been in opposition for the past, well, three years. After that, it was, it was not an opposition anymore. It was a dictatorship, maybe. What would you say, Priya, you I'm asking specifically, to the incumbent that now is squatting in office and needs to be in opposition? What will you say to them to get their act ready and be a good opposition? So, young in 2015, this nation learned that they can change governments. They learned that. They learned that if we don't like how you're serving, if we don't like what you're doing, if we don't like how you're dealing with us, if we don't like how you're um, impacting upon our lives as a country and as individuals, we could shy you out of there. We could change you. The nation learned that, and they changed the PPP out with that lesson. In, mm -hmm. in this new Guyana, in the Guyana that we're in now, nobody should be afraid to go into opposition. Go into opposition be an effective opposition and in five years you could be in government again it is very very possible the problem is now with these guys i don't know how they could hope to garner enough votes and support to get anywhere close to government again if they continue down this road if you continue down this road the credibility the trust that people had in them they're simply not going to um be able to to hold that into another election and so for me it is it, i i can't imagine i have thought about this a hundred times why would they be doing something like this very very short-sighted mm -hmm. very short-sighted and very um very not taking into consideration the new guyana we have for me right this here is a lack of confidence in yourself because if you don't believe you can win these citizens back and you mm -hmm. have to trick and thief from them to get into office, then you clearly don't believe you have anything to offer. So they have a right. serious self-confidence issue, in my view. Deconstructing mm -hmm. rigging. And you know, uh, you I, know, I don't think the issue, well, self-confidence issue might be one of the issues, but my assessment of the situation is this. These guys, most of them, they want to stay in government to protect themselves because yeah. they are aware more than we could ever know about the corruption they were involved in. And this new spin about power sharing, government of national unity by their acolytes is not to serve. It is to say in government, somehow or the other, to protect themselves from prison ICA. Mm -hmm. That's what all of this is about. It's not about service to the people, their supporters, and want to go back to do the best they can to maybe be reelected. It's how mm -hmm. I preserve uh, the loot, how I preserve uh, myself from investigation because the, the, the fraud and the corruption is so blatant uh, that you don't have to go and look for it. When, when we go in government, you're not going to look for this corruption that these guys were involved in. 
and some of the people who are screaming the most uh, from APNU AFC are the right. people who are most involved in corrupt practices. So that is their fundamental um, reason of holding on. It has been since um, uh, 21st of, of December 2018. It's been since it's 1964, been Joe. It's been since 1964. I'm dealing with now. I'm dealing with now. And, and you know, <laughs> I'll say this here uh, to, to, to persons who might think this program is bashing PNC. You must accept, citizens, you must accept that the behavior of the PNC is in the DNA of the party itself. Because let us examine what is happening. Most of the people who are in the front line of the leadership of the PNC were not in the leadership and some of them was not even in the PNC during the 28 years. But even with this new breed, even with the younger breed, the attitude is the same. It's the same believing they could railroad people, they could run over the Guyanese people, they could bully the Guyanese people not understanding it's a different day and time and that's why i from day one even before elections when people were suggesting uh they might want to rig the election my position was always that the young people of this country will not allow this country to be a dictatorship their mm -hmm. life is a different life that they have that freedom to do what they want to do. They will not give it up. And that is the reason why, as you see 2020, even after the elections and all the attempt to rig, you see the young people resolutely continuing mm -hmm. to fight because oh. they see, see this as impacting their own personal life. Correct. Leonard, you wanted to interject. Yes, uh, deconstructing rigging. I want to ask uh, the PPVC, how many uh, of the 2,339 uh, polling stations, how many of them did not have a political representative, maybe from the APNU side or maybe from the PPP side? Uh, do we have an idea? Well, the PPP, I can say, pellucidly and without fear of contradiction, we manage and man every polling place in the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. And let me say this. Uh, places that in times past we had difficulty uh, finding people in those communities. Since 2015, that has changed. There are hundreds of persons in Georgetown, thousands across the country, who were supporters and members of the People's National Congress, many who were activists of the People's National Congress, who today, for that matter, two, three years ago, they have joined the People's Progressive Party and they have been working with the People's Progressive Party. So let a place like uh, Region 4, by midnight, 2 o'clock, we had all our statements of polls because we were able to man all of those. Uh, what I was trying to establish is that uh, nobody could walk into a polling place uh, without the other side scrutinizing without the other side checking the folio and the face no, and Leonard, everything. Leonard, the, 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 the PNC leaders know that. It is just attempting to, 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 to create new conditions. When they were saying they won, all of that wasn't um, a conversation when Mingo rigged the numbers. It is after, every day they had to find a new story to tell the Guyanese people hoping they would believe that. But I say this, they're only fooling themselves and uh, the minimal amount of supporters. Most mm -hmm. of their supporters, they know better. Uh, and somebody just say earlier, I think you mentioned, uh, there are people who are PNC members and so who are embarrassed uh, about what has been happening uh, since election but day. But we have another serious problem, Joe. While we, I mean, we are focused on, on these uh, attempts at rigging, but, um, you know, you have, you have a president that has made an appearance in front of the public more times in the past 
two weeks than he did over the past five years. Now, when he emerged this time, he is emerged with a new uh, chorus. Now he wants a four four pronged approach, a uh, four stepped approach. And you know the truth is, prayer in the U.S. or in any other country. Look what happened in Saint Kitts and Nevis. The media knows what the numbers are, share out the numbers, and the loser concedes without even waiting for the election body to declare. They, in other words, they don't wait for the moment of shame. They concede gracefully. Here, the man is saying, I am going to wait until Claude Singh declares. Priya, what is your take? What is he waiting for? Well, let's remember, Yog, that we had the election on the 2nd. Mr. Granger, by, by half day of the 2nd, had spoken in one of his rare appearances, spoken to the press, and said the election day procedures were going very well. He spoke afterwards and said elections were fairly and freely ran, and they were transparent and free from fear and so on. On, the, on Thursday, Mr. Granger was at, uh, on the 4th, sorry, that's Wednesday, at a celebration on Lamaha Street, thanking his supporters for, for causing his victory and his win and promising them that he would give them a better life and uh, saying that by tomorrow morning he would be sworn in. So Mr. Granger was saying that he won. Bear yes. in mind that we spoke about these polling agents that the party, the PNC, had in every single booth. So the PNC knew the same thing. Same information the PDP had, the PNC had. And so by the midday of the third, they knew they had lost the election. So the, the narrative started with that they had won. You know, Mr. Granger was dressed at least three times uh, to get sworn in. The army ceremonial people were dressed. You know, the, the white clothes ones with the drums and so on to go and swear him in. He was ready to celebrate. Um, Mr. Mingo did a declaration. That declaration was initiated by the court. Mr. Mingo went and did a second declaration that can be held up against today's declaration where he gave Mr. Granger 19,000 plus votes that he did not get. Mr. Mm -hmm. Granger, knowing fully well he never got those votes, were, was willing to go and get sworn in and celebrate his victory based on that. He is now saying that there were some there were such massive errors, 90,000 people who were, were not supposed to have voted, voted, and 90,000 votes are discredited. We live in Guyana. We know whether 90,000 people could vote and nothing, and it wasn't any big story on election day. The moment you had two or three of those, those happening across the country, we would have heard of a big outcry from the APNU, um, AFC about it. So now he's saying, that they have all these discrepancies. Let me just point out to you that in every single election, in every single country, there will be errors, mistakes, negligence, deliberate flaws um, happening in an election, simply because you have people managing it. Where, wherever you put together a large enough number of people, some of them will be delinquent. Some of them will be lazy, mm -hmm. them will perform excellently. That's just how the world is. In 2015, Mr. Granger assumed office with 4,000 um, ballots that were spoiled or what you called, um, what we call rejected. 4,000 ballots. This election, you have just a little bit over 4,000 ballots that are rejected. You know what I mean? And we have far more voters. So there's no difference here, Yog. In 2015, when Mr. Granger took the presidency, some of the polling agents, polling uh, presiding officers across this country forgot to stamp ballots. But we didn't tell them you can't get the office then because you had a couple of presiding officers that made mistakes. When Mr. Granger assumed office in 2015, you had people who marked the ballot twice, just like they did this time. So these kinds of errors happen at every election. Do they happen? Are they in such a magnitude? To change the result of the election, the answer is no. The answer is absolutely no, not in this election. And you see it in the numbers. So the point I'm making is he he has to change the narrative now from we won. Because remember, this thing started out as we won. We got more votes than you, and the recount is going to show more votes. When the recount started not showing up more votes and showing 99% 99 accuracy of what came out on E-Night, it started becoming, oh, dead people voted. 
then dead people who were supposed to have voted started coming forward and saying, well, here, look, look, I'm right here. I'm dead. I, I'm right here in flesh. I'm alive and well. People were put to the indignity of doing videos and saying that I am alive and well. I'm right here. I voted. Then that one didn't catch on. So they started going to the one that people migrated. So much so that they sent a list to the commission of police and the commission of police purportedly responded saying, yeah, these are the names of the persons who migrated. Hundreds of those people who are purportedly migrated have turned up again on video with their documents mm -hmm. in affidavit form, some of them, saying right. we did not. So, so, so on that point, changing. let me ask you this question quickly. On that point of the commission of police, has your party written to GCOM to say that there are so many persons on the commission of police's report that are, well, to, to rubbish the commission of police report? Do you know if your party has done so? Our party has um, three commissioners on the G on the Guyana Elections Commission. I'm not sure if we've written officially, but the information is there publicly. Um, well, people well, have sworn the reason, affidavits. Mm -hmm. The reason I asked you this is as follows. Um, Mr. Vincent Alexander was on in room 592 a week ago, and he said, being in public space is not being in the knowledge of GCOM. And if somebody has a grievance, you need to officially inform GCOM. So that was my right. question. So I saw his, um, I saw a press conference where he said the same thing. He said literally, and I was stunned at this, shocked, stunned, and disgusted, frankly. He said, look, yes, I have seen the newspaper reports. I have seen the affidavits. But until they come to me in GCOM and tell me they're alive, then I am not, I'm going to treat them as though they're dead. Well, I didn't come to you and show you I voted either. And the people whose votes you are re re relying on, they didn't walk into GCOM and show you they voted either. So how come you're mm -hmm. relying on those votes, but you don't want to rely on people? GCOM has a record, you. GCOM's record says these people voted. GCOM has no reason to go beyond and behind that record. And even if they had reason, they cannot go beyond and behind that record to use a third party's information to influence what their record tells them happened on mm -hmm. election day. And mm -hmm. so I was very stunned to hear Mr. Alexander take that position, which is essentially that, look, yeah, she's in cry. I see her there, but until she come and tell me, at GCOM that she's alive, I'm going to treat her as dead. Now, is that a reasonable position to take? That seems to be a position that is advancing his party's attempt to rig this election. And it's really quite shameful. I can't believe that at this age, because he's an old man, this is his probably his last hurrah. And at this time, in this age, that he's prepared to go out like this, trying to rig an election all over again. It's, and that's the problem here. We have people from that era that are mm -hmm. running the system. And there's a question so, so, here for yeah, uh, Mr. Hamilton. Mr. Hamilton, you would have seen a robust uh, voting day. The systems are robust. And it seems as if nothing much would have happened that would cause an election to be uh, declared null and void. But let me ask you, what are some of the loopholes that need to be closed as far as GCOM is concerned, as a former um, employee with them? You know, the, the, the only thing I think, and, and we were saying, um, we recommended uh, going forward to the 20, going to the 2020 election. I think uh, the, the, the mobile scanners might be uh, an additional tool uh, to use because remember you have uh, the fingerprints, now we send them to Canada to do ex so, I mean, you have you have the um, you have the the folio, but I suspect going forward, if we want to um, if we want to uh, improve the system, it might be where you have uh, for the specific polling place, you have them uh, uh, it, it, uh, where a person could uh, put their their their. Um, fingerprint and, and it matches or something like that. Mm -hmm. Look, honest, uh, Leonard, know. could I could I answer here? <laughs> yes, but the, the, the other thing to I wanted to say this, some people talk about Guyana is unprepared for electronic voting. We can't even get the internet proper. You, you know? 
So, so don't you, you know, some people are saying about that, but uh, the paper-based system uh, for society, a society like Guyana based on our demographic and how the country is situated is the best system in my view. Right. And, and just anything, before you comment, go on, go on. Pretty. Right. So I am saying anything that would enhance, you know, more scrutiny would be great. But I will say this with confidence. We have a, an almost perfect system here. And like I said, any system that has people attending to it will have human error. It don't matter which computer you put there and how much scanners you put there. If a man got put your finger on and he scan it properly, you'll have some human error. We have such a perfect system that the election was had on the second. By the fourth, Mr. Mingo tried to start, you started seeing evidence of that rig by the fourth. And on the fourth, we started the objections. That's how easy and quick it was to pick this thing up. Um, so it's, it's so, Mr. Mingo called 21 boxes, Mr. Mingo's staff, that did not match statements of poll. And we stopped him, we saw it from the first box that didn't match. We stopped him at box 21. That's how, that's how efficient it is. And that's when the whole story started unraveling, right? The point I'm making is in 1992, when the Carter Center came and Mr. Carter came, remember this election was supposed to happen in 1990. Now, if you read the history on it, you will see they took from 1990 to 1992 to put a set of systems in place, including things like counting at the place of poll and, mm -hmm. um, party agents sitting down in their observer groups passing an observer election law uh, a whole host of things that combine together to give us a system that is very transparent and that is robust in its mm. rejection of wrongdoing now in every like i said in every country you'll have errors and whatever you'll even probably have wrongdoing it's whether it, it amounts to so much that the election result will change. In 2015, mm -hmm. if you go back into the archives, you will see the international community said in almost the, the, those many words. They said, listen, PPP, we know you have a problem and you're querying seven boxes. At that time, you may recall that the People's Progressive Party was asking for a recount of seven, zero, seven, S-E-V-E-N, seven boxes that they refused to recount that had the false statements of poll. And the people said, you know what? They probably have problems in those boxes. We're not even telling you that they don't. We're saying to you that in every election, even in our country, there are problems. The thing is that it's not enough to change the result of the election. At that time, they had right. less than 5,000 votes. So I will say to you, to your question, Leonard, that I don't see, um, if you have someone who intends to rig the system, you could put the, an almost, you could put a perfect system in there. They'll find ways to rig it. Mr. Mingo didn't rig this system because it was bad. Mr. Mingo came clumsily with numbers that did not match the numbers that the people gave the APNU and just called them out. Now, you could put the most robust Scrutin scrutinizing system in there. If you have a Mr. Mingo who's willing to just shy away all the records, whether they're computerized or man-made, and stand up and call out numbers he made up himself, there's nothing you can do about that except stop him in his tracks. Would, right. would it be correct so, to ask whether this is rigging? What would have transpired those attempts? If, 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 I didn't hear that. I want to ask if, if the word rig would be correct to put to the circle to, to what transpired. Attempted. Attempted rig. Rig means to do something that did not happen. Rig means to um, change in a way to bring about a result that was not intended. So there was an, we stopped it, so it didn't bring about a result. So it was an attempted rig. Joe, um, currently, I, I want your opinion on this. There, there is a position that has been um, shared on social media one person who has been a very, very strong activist, even though he's operating out from the United States. These people don't spend time in Guyana. But he has said that um, President Granger's silence on the PPP's uh, elections fraud um, and so forth and so on, it, you cannot be a head of state and demonstrate the seeming disinterest in a matter of national urgency that can potentially plunge the country into unprecedented disorder. President Granger's silence and inaction 
has already damaged the image of the coalition he heads and our country's image regionally and internationally. Joe, should we be feeling some sorry, some sorrow, some pity for Mr. Granger? And th 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 this you know, you just read from one of these... Um, Bark, I uh, think The that public was. is here. I, I don't want to... Oh, okay, 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 okay. But, but the point is this. Yoga and, uh, and Leonardo said, the dilemma the PNC found themselves in is how to tell their supporters they lost. And I speak from a position of experience. The same dilemma we had 97, 2001, and 2006. You understand me? When you have thousands of people gather, um, I recall, and I say this for the public, that you understand the, the, the vibes. Uh, when one year Corbyn couldn't even come down to speak to the people, he had to use a microphone with, 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 a, with, with a speaker's box. So you understand what is happening there. And so by two o'clock, they knew they lost the elections of, of the third, because by two o'clock of the third, we knew we won. But Joe, what are they hoping for? Everybody well, knows the result. A bingo. They no, no. Were, and now what are they hoping for? Oh, what are they hoping for now? I suspect this, you know, all the antics are political antics and machinations to somehow bend the rule to allow for this conversation about some government of national unity or power share and whatever. But the issue is you cannot have any government governance conversation unless you conclude the elections. Mm -hmm. Somebody got to be president elected and we know who is the president elect is Irfan Ali because the PPP garnered 230 something thousand votes. So what they're hoping for, and, and you see all their acolytes chanting out there, the David Hines is, I see what's his name come out today. Uh, he's my countryman, but that is the most, it's a total lunatic speaking there to make those kind of recommendations. Mm -hmm. They're free to say that. I mean, these guys are going crazy. Well, but, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Joe, Joe, wait, 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 wait. Let me share this with you, Joe. Tomorrow night, my guest in room 592 is Mr. Henry Jeffrey. And <laughs> I think they, I think you could tell Henry, I think he was locked down too long. Something's wrong with him. And, and face, kind of to facing, Mr., facing Mr. Henry Jeffrey tomorrow night is no other than Sanjeev Datadin. So tomorrow night will be a hot session, but I am going to allow Mr. Henry Jeffrey to ventilate or to articulate his cause for sheer government. However, I want to say this to the people. Listen, I no, don't think no, this no, is. No, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No this is my view. Oh, hold on, Joe. This is my view, <laughs> and this is the view here at this time. And our two guests can respond to this. I think that all those proponents of shared governance and inclusive governance knows not what they are talking about. All people are thinking is they want to share the pie. That is not shared governance, because I say this, if you take five incompetent people from here and five incompetent people from here, God help us all. Shared governance has to be something that must be upon the call of the people of this country. In addition, I will go so far to say, one must not benefit from their crime. If you steal these elections, you or cannot- attempt to steal. Attempt to steal. At, right. You cannot and must not be allowed to benefit from that act. And that is as far as I say. Joe, back to you. Sorry. No, Henry, be, be, Henry before you say that, yo, but let me ask you, could, could you really punish the populace, half of the populace, who might not necessarily be, have to be blamed by, for what the politicians would have done that represented them? No, I am not saying blame the populace. I'm playing, saying, listen, the population has nothing to do with this, these attempts at, at squatting now, Leonard. This is an attempt at squatting in office. This has nothing to do with population. The population is listening to the, to the so-called leaders that has lied to them consistently for five years. 
and Priya said it right. What happened in 2015? The population spoke, the PPP listened, and they went into opposition. The population has spoken again. The government of the day, Leonard, whether it's PPP or who, has to look after everyone, not only their own voters and supporters. I'm sorry to carry on at you, my co-host. But, but we often conflate, we often conflate inclusive governance and shared governance with meaning. Like you said, Yo, that leaders at the top who foist themselves on people and call themselves leader must be the people who share that governance. For me, any model of shared governance must see, must result in everybody feeling equally involved, equally served. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to go to leaders to do that. How could we include the various communities across this country and how they can be, how they can govern themselves? How can we give effect to Article 13 of the Constitution to, be, to govern inclusively without necessarily going to people who are, look, the leaders of the AP and UAFC now, and I don't want to get into their personal leadership battles, but that whole Brickford Burke thing, I think, is a leadership battle going on there. The leaders of the AP and UAFC are not leading for their people. They're leading for a very narrow group of persons, numbering less than 100 in the leadership who are benefiting financially and materially from the spoils of the country or from the resources of the country. They are not leading for their people, whoever their people might be. And so when people suffer in this last two months when we had a COVID lockdown, the APNU supporters suffered alongside the PPP supporters just as badly. The point I'm making is, Leonard, you seem to be conflating um, shared governance and inclusive governance and any model that kind of puts forward that with the two sets of leaders coming together. And while I would concede that usually it is leaders of various constituencies and communities that talk on issues, it doesn't have to be confined to that. Any, any kind of model uh, that that attempts to address the issue of people feeling sidelined because I think we have to face that that is whether it is done or not is not the issue. It is how people feel when one group or the other take power. Then we have to talk to the people. How do we get people to feel that, um, that they're included in government? And I don't necessarily think that has to be dealing with a small set of leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joe, I want to throw this back at you, but before asking you to speak on it, viewers and listeners, I want to remind all of you. Many years ago, a gentleman wrote a book, a booklet. He compiled it rather. The name of it is The Three Trials of Arnold Rampasad, compiled by Moses Nagamotu, that spoke at length about rigging. Read that book, ladies and gentlemen. And you would question that same gentleman who write it for what he is now accepting. Joe, back to you on this question no, I was of rigging. Saying that, that Henry Jeffrey went far beyond this conversation of um, shared governance or inclusive governance. Henry Jeffrey is saying uh, that the chairperson should not make. Uh, oh, the chairperson should should suggest or impose on the nation a government headed by the chancellor for interim period. I, I mean, I'm not a lawyer. Priya is the, is the lawyer here, but uh, the thing is so madly, I, 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 you know, the thing is so foolish. How could a man who was a professor and a doctor and whatever suggest that? And I mean, this kind of construct in law and the constitution and nothing, and he's, uh, saying that um, GCOM, GCOM must now take away all our votes and our franchise and forget about it. You know, and David Hines, just like the same thing, burn all the ballot boxes and um, impose um, some governance structure. Let me say this, importantly to know, the persons who are speaking to this matter, they don't mean the people as prayer is is speaking about. They are concerned as, what's his name, Nigel User says, sharing the corn. 
this governance model that they're proposing is for them to be participants and to stay in government. It has nothing to do with the people. For us, and we have indicated in our manifesto, that we don't believe that this conversation about a new governance model, the elites, political elites, should sit down in some room and share out positions and ministries. We will go to the people in government to discuss this matter why, when we deal with constitutional reform. And the people will say to us what they want going forward and how they want it to be structured. And that is the proper and right way to go. Not for all these opportunists who are bantering out there about this matter so that they can participate in, in state spoils. That is what it is. Right. And, and I'm particularly suspicious, you. Let me tell you why. We had, and I don't want to, I mean, frankly, I love Henry Jeffrey. I, I, I value his friendship. But I think he had a mad moment there, and, and he is capable of writing. So what would usually be a coca top gaff, he come and put it in pen and paper and, and send it to the newspapers. You can't just get up one day and decide, you know, let the chancellor take over and force these two parties to work together. That's it. Our laws don't allow for that. But outside of all of that, um, we had the AP and UAFC in office for the last five years three solid years they had no clue that they would lose the no confidence vote their ear wasn't to the ground they didn't see it coming in that time um they took power and uh, even when they were in in government and opposition but the majority all those commissions and standing committees and so on in the parliament for example uh the management committee usually has x number of parliamentary um PPP people, uh, opposition people and government people, they had the power to switch all those numbers so that they control everything. So Mr. Granger, w when he was in opposition, they uh, voted so that he, because it's usually a government person that leads the, con the standing committee on constitutional reform, he led it, he did nothing. Um, when they went back into office, they changed it back so that they could lead it again, so that, and they did nothing again. The point I'm making is there was not only no effort, so not only did they omit to do anything to share power, they actually reversed things that had been put into the Constitution during the constitutional reform um, program. When those things were put in place, they were put in place with a view to bringing on this power, sharing more and more. When they had a chance, not only did they sleep on it, not only did they lie on it, not only did they omit to do anything, they actually reversed things that were meant to share power at various different levels. And that, for me, these are people who are now trying to steal the whole election, the whole government. Those are not people you can trust necessarily, the characters I'm talking about. Um, to, to speak to and believe that it's going to reach the people we hold our holy books to serve and swear to serve. We are there to serve. Whoever goes into government is there to serve the people of this country. How does that happen? It's not necessarily by going through um, people who call themselves their leaders. I believe if you speak to the people of this country in their communities, you're going to hear some very different things. And I'm saying to you, that I have seen Article 13 work. And I'll just give you a small example very quickly. The Sex Offenses Act, by the time it came to the National Assembly, you had, frankly, men on both sides of the House who were uncomfortable with some of those provisions, but they dared not stand up and say they're uncomfortable with it or oppose it in any way, because by then the people of this country, black, Indian, PNC, PPP, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, all of them had already decided what they wanted to go into this legislation. And how did they decide that? We went village to village, community to community, to say, here is what our law is now. Here are the problems with it. Here is what we want to suggest. What do you think you want to put in this? And then we included all of that into the legislation. So that's just a small example of taking government to people. To the mm -hmm. people, it does not necessarily mean that two mm -hmm. leaders got to sit down at a table and share the corn. You take so Correct. much money and I take so much money. 
That's right. how they do it. Then I I, I didn't know this how they do it, York. But let me ask quickly. <laughs> well, when you read some of what they're saying, that's exactly. <laughs> it seems to be to be more about a material sharing than a beneficial sharing. What are the people going to get out of? It? With us until 2020, how does a PPP government intend to deal with the issue of corruption? The 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 thing is, I suspect. We have to, well, let, let me back up to make the point. One of the ways, let, if you look at the American system, the IRS, people are terrified by the IRS because a man who is involved in corruption, what they do, the IRS will say, okay, you said you accomplish and acquire all of these things. Show us how you did it, and did you pay the taxes for all of this that you used? So the GRA could be a powerful tool to utilize um, in, in, in going forward uh, to help in that in that regard. Of course, the the, the, the but, but Joe Joe, let me let me interject there. The GRA itself has <laughs> been even under the PVP. So you, we cannot, these things are knowledge in public place. The GRA itself has been a tool of a government and has certainly been a tool of the current government. So that, to, that is, I would believe, that I would believe that is a very weak, sorry Joe, but that's a very weak example. To the, to the, we have to make a robust also, um, the, the, the commission that we have to, what you call it again? I saw them send me um, documents there the other day. Integrity the, Commission. Um, integrity Commission. <laughs> um, we have to strengthen the Integrity Commission, put some more money in it, let them have some um, investigators and all of those kinds of things. Added to that, uh, the government in itself has to take action against persons who you have enough evidence um, to suggest that they are all involved in corruption. Mm -hmm. I think fundamentally, it is the government that will have to act and not to shield persons, not to protect anyone. And that is how people will believe that indeed um, we plan to deal robustly with that matter because I know so, that- so I wanna yeah, I want to I wanna cut you there, Joe, because we are getting down to program time, and I want to deal with something else very quickly. I want to invite, uh, whether it's you two or invite other people from the PPP slate to come on this program and talk, let's talk about corruption. Um, but look, there are some other realities facing us presently, and very quickly, I'm going to put it to you people. Kaisuko has been declaring itself bankrupt. So while a government, while the incumbent is squatting in office, People's lives are being even further torn apart. And no one in this incumbent government has anything to say to alleviate the concerns of people. That, Leonard, is another indictment. That is another nail in their coffins, I believe. However, this election, Spria, you first, these elections, while we all believe, or everybody holds on to this notion of 16 as being D-Day, what confidence the PPP or you as individuals have that 16th is indeed D-Day that will see the, the PPP um, come back into office? Me first. Yes. Um, I, I believe that there is very strong, I feel very strongly that the commission is going to do what is the right thing to do. I don't expect the, G the government commissioners to do anything more than carry the government line. But, uh, and by government, I mean AP and UAFC commissioners. I believe Claudette Singh is going to do the right thing. I know people are hesitant in, and, and are a little suspicious and, and reluctant to feel that much confidence in her. And they're reluctant because I, I think it's fair to say that she could have acted more, much more firmly and decisively in the weeks that led up to here. But I believe we have seen, um, look, I, I don't think anybody in their wildest mind could have imagined that this would have happened. So perhaps she didn't have um, 
the, the understanding of what was going on, but I think she, she must have a better understanding now. And I believe she's going to do the right thing. I think, um, and the right thing would really be to receive the report from Mr. Lowenfield, a report that, that sums up the, tabula the certificates that have been tabulated over the last um, 33 days and uh, declare based on those results. I believe it's going to probably happen even before the 16th. That's my view. I will say this too, if, if it doesn't happen, uh, she's going to be, that will be, Justice Singh has a chance here to define what her legacy will be. I think up to now, up to the point that she went into the GCOM, she, she had a very firm, we all felt like bowing when she passed because she had that aura of doing, serving this nation very, very well. And not only an aura, she actually did serve for a long time, many years, hard work. And uh, that got a little shaken. And we, we have to be frank about it. On the days of 4th, 5th, 6th, uh, all the way up to the 13th of March, when um, we thought and people thought there could have been more effort by the GCOM chair to pull rein this process back in, that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So now the Justice, the Madam Justice, retired Claudia Singh, has a grand opportunity to define her legacy and okay. show us decisive, informative, um, deliberate judgment that aims to bringing about justice. And I believe right. she has that capacity and I believe she's going to do that. And if she doesn't, the nation will speak again. So it's one of those things, those moments you have in your life. Thank you. Joe, over to you. Do you, uh, I want to quote from Ms. Manita and what Priya said just now. Do you guys believe she will do the right thing or do you want her to do the right thing? Uh, there is a difference there, eh? Because, uh, Joe, over to you. Sorry. Two minutes. Joe, we got three minutes. The thing is, and I'm being in my head, what else can the chairman do in law other than declare the elections? What else? So, so that is the point. There's mm -hmm. one door you have to go through here. And Joe, is there in your experience any other avenue to attempt to rig these elections between no, now and the No, but the thing the rigging is over. Okay. The, 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 the documents right now are with Kid Lowen Field. What could he do with the numbers? The whole world has the numbers. The commission well, Joe, already has the numbers. The point is, what else can the chairman do? I said earlier, an election commences with a commission preparing a voter's list, because without mm -hmm. a voter's list, you can't have an election. And right. an elections conclude with a declaration Correct. of results of the election. So, so you said it. I mean, what else yes. can become the chairman of do? And, and Leonard, we got to remember Joe's and Priya's words tonight. They believe this is what Claudette Singh will do. And Joe has questioned, what else can the chairman do? I hope that the next week or so will show us that you both, you both have, have stood oh, in, you, 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 in this conversation you, here. What else can the Ghana Elections Commission do? other than declare the results. Not declare it. Yeah, you would have pause. said so a month ago. At, I know we're at program time, but let me just pause. It may well have been a patient, prudent person who let these 20, 33 days pass. Look in front of the public's eye on national TV, on the World Wide Web. We tabulated these votes and here are the numbers. Thank Florida you. Things. I asked Claudia Singh, I can't change Thank that. You. So you're just bringing to me a fait accompli. As, so, as the chairperson. We're out of time. And Priya, let me please invite you to join us tomorrow at one at two o'clock if you can, because we didn't get to do the education discussion. Yeah. Please, yes, if you okay. can. Viewers and listeners, it's been great having Joe Hamilton and Priya Manikchan in our room 592 tonight. And we certainly look to continuing this discussion. Tomorrow night, please join me with Ms. Dr. Henry Jeffrey and Sanjeev Datadin to discuss that whole article and that whole piece of... Uh, um, thoughts that would have been expressed by Henry Jeffrey. But tonight we have looked at rigging, we have looked at these elections, and both of our guests tonight have expressed great confidence that D-Day 
will see the chairman of GCOM express and declare that the PPP would have won these elections. So thank you, Joe. Thank you, Priya, for being here tonight. And thanks to my co-hosts who have been most gracious throughout the program. Thank you, Kevin, Kaicho Radio, and Mr. Glenn Lal. Viewers and listeners, have a great night. Bye-bye now. Stay safe, stay well, and do a prayer for Guyana. Goodbye. Thank you.